Lord, we come into this place and we exalt you and we lift your name on high. And God, our, our hearts may be in a place that's celebratory, but Lord, we, we stop and we pause and we recognize today that if there's anything that's worth celebrating, it's your love for us. God, that you care for us, that you desire to be with us, that your hearts are turned towards us. And so, God, we put first things first in our hearts today, Lord. And we declare that you are holy, that you are majestic, that you are glorious, and that your love never fails. So thank you for moments in your presence today, God. We're grateful for you and grateful for your love for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. How are we doing today? You feeling all right? Anything going on today? <laughs> Do me a favor, turn around and say hello to somebody and then you can take a seat. While you're being seated, let me say hello to everyone who is watching online. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I also want to take a moment to say hello to all of the guys in our Lansing campus. Hey guys, thank you for joining us. We're grateful for you. Oh wow, a uh, little bit going on today. Exciting day. You guys having fun so far? Good, good, good. Uh, I. Looks like you all called each other this morning and decided what to wear. Um, I would like to note today, just please, for a minute, I, I could take it in. It won't be all the time, all right? Um, but any time that the 49ers have a chance to lose, I'm okay with that. So I do want to just take a moment and say thank you to all of those of you who reached out or reached out on social media and said happy birthday to me yesterday. I'm grateful for that. Um, if you want to know how old I am, I am uh, wake up with an injury years old. And um, for real, as of Monday, I got up and uh, when I stood up on the ground, I, I just, I, I limped. I was limping coming into the office and people in the office were like, what happened? And I said, well, I went to bed and I fell asleep, and I stayed in that same position the whole night. And then when I woke up, I somehow had mildly fractured my foot. I'm not sure what happened, but, uh, but I'm, <laughs> I'm all right anyway. But thank you. You know, I, I get so excited when I think about all of the ways that we get to serve this church and serve our community. Uh, and, and what I know, what I know with 100% certainty um, is that all of the, the outreaches that we do and, and the, the food pantries and the, the things that we do that serve people, I'm grateful for the opportunity to do them, but I am 100% positive and I know in my heart that it is impossible to do that without you, without the incredible people in this church who have a, a willingness to, to give, to be generous and make an investment into the lives of people, but also have a willingness to serve a willingness to give of themselves, to give up their time, to make an investment into the lives of people. Uh, and, and what I know is that not only is it making a difference in the lives of those that we serve, but as people are serving, it's also making a difference in their lives as well. And I want you today to, to hear the story of, of just an incredible human being who's such a faithful servant to this place. And I want you to hear from Mr. Ray Baker today. Um, <laughs> He is such a faithful guy. He's been serving in harvesters, and he's taught classes, and he, he uh, is a faithful greeter at the doors and has such a, a genuine heart for people, and he wants to share his heart today. So would you take a look at this? I'm Ray Baker, and uh, don't let this FBI on this hat lead you astray. I don't work for the FBI. What that is, that stands for firm believer in Jesus. I've uh, been in and out of church pretty much most of my life. And I gave my life to Jesus when I was 33 years old. At that time, my addiction that I had at that time went away. I came to church mostly out of obligation. And uh, after a while, I left the church for several years, chasing the dollar. And then one Sunday morning, 
at five o'clock, I turned the TV on and, and I watched Dr. Stanley with In Touch Ministries. At that time, I left the church the first time because I wasn't grounded or rooted in anything. But when I listened to Dr. Stanley and his message was, messages were about, you need to be in the Word of God. And, and he spoke a lot about, uh, a lot about relationship with Jesus. And as, my, as, as time went on and I'd done that, I put Jesus first and foremost in my life in everything I'd done. Before my wife, before my family, before anything else, he came first. The, the closer my relationship with Jesus grew, the more I changed. It changed my, it changed my relationships because Jesus' love flowed down, in and through me and down to every relationship that I had. It just transformed my life forever. It's the greatest thing i ever done. The next thing is circumstances of life can be brutal. I don't care if it's loss of loved ones, financial, whatever the crisis might be. But when your dominion of your mind is focused on Jesus, your eternal being is not, your eternal emotion is not overcome by anxiety, uh, anxiety, depression, or fear. Because Jesus will reach right down, pick you up with his right hand, and he'll lead you and guide you. You're never alone. Let you draw on your own strength, on his strength, to get through every circumstance of life that there is. The third one is service. That's when I came to Vineyard Church. Because after, after the growth in that relationship with Jesus, I had the desire to serve Jesus and his church family somewhere. That's when I came to Vineyard, because I'm only about two or three minutes from here, and it was the closest church I could get to. I come here to serve, and when I learned what my spiritual gift was, how God made me, and where he wanted me to work in his church family, I came and served in those places out of desire, love, compassion, and commitment. It's the greatest thing I've ever done in my life is to enhance my relationship with Jesus Christ because it just transformed me from the inside out. A life with Jesus, it's not about me, myself, and I anymore. It's about what can I do for you? How can I help you? I love Jesus. I love this church family. I love the leadership of this church. And Vineyard Church is, is the only place for me to be. That's special. So grateful for his heart and for his willingness to serve. And what an example to all of us. Um, and it's not just him. It's people like him who make this place go. It's people like you. So thank you so much for all that you do. You're having an impact on the lives of people, and we're so grateful. Put the ways that you can give today up on the screens. There's kiosks in the back of the room if you came prepared to give in person today. But we're, again, so thankful for each of you and, and uh, excited that we get to do all of this together. Okay. Um, Look, I'm going to say it, but like, it's, we're going to do some things different today, all right? So uh, are you ready to get in the Word? Yeah. Let's do it. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if you guys know this. Uh, I did not play in the NFL. I don't know what that's like. Um, wow. <laughs> Quick to judgment. Um, no, but I thought, what an incredible opportunity today for us to, to really sort of lean into today and get some, gain some perspective and learn some things today. And so we've invited someone to come and join us today and, and have a conversation around football and around faith uh, in, a way, in a way that I can't. And so I would, Vineyard Church, if you please, would welcome uh, an NFL veteran, a pro bowler, and a former chief. Can you please welcome to the platform, Mr. Kendall Gammon. Thank you. 
Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's my great pleasure. This is fun. It is. This is fun. It's a good day. Um, so, okay, in a way that, that we can't, you played in a Super right. Bowl, right? So in a way that we can't uh, understand, maybe give us some perspective today for the players who are in Las Vegas right now. They're waking up, right. and it's Super Bowl Sunday. They're going to play in you know, the biggest game of their lives. Give us some perspective on, on what they're feeling, how that feels. Well, a lot of them are going to play on sleep deprivation because they couldn't sleep last night. Sure, yeah. Uh, that was me in, in 1995. And, and, and you get up, you know, each and every week, 16 games are going on in the NFL, but you know this is the only game. It, it's the national borderline world holiday. And um, you got a chance to get that ring. And th that's what you're after. Certainly the financial compensation, everything is, is, is there, but you're trying to get that ring, be able to say you're the best. And um, it's cool. And then you think, oh man, I've got to wait forever because the game's you know later on in the day, and that is tough. Yeah. I mean, it really is. And there's a lot going through your mind. Make no <laughs> make no mistake about it. A lot going through your mind. Yeah, I bet. I bet. And so, um, Chiefs fans right now are unbelievably spoiled, right? I they mean, are. like this is. Although I think I think they get it. Yeah, they, do, oh, do, do they? Yeah. Um, <coughs> this is like said the Seahawks yeah, fan, right? right yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> like six AFC championships or, you know. Yeah, they've gone to, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, so just from a guy who understands this game and understands this, you know, can give us the perspective, how, how special is this team and these guys that are playing for the Chiefs right now? Um, unbelievably special. You, you bring it up, and, and I think it starts with, uh, one or two people, or maybe both people, when you, when you talk about Big Red and Andy Reid, the head coach, and, and what he does and how he is and, and how he communicates with the guys, I think it's phenomenal. But, but Patrick Mahomes and, and how he leads, and we hear a lot about Patrick Mahomes and, how, and, and the words that come to mind for me, and, and they are true, which is he's real and he's authentic. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not always the case for, for people in the NFL. When you've got somebody like that who a lot of kids, a lot of people look up to, uh, that's a special thing. I, I, I will say this. I was fortunate enough to uh, do the first ever interview with him in the locker room after his, it, it was the rookie year, the last game of the season. Alex Smith had been benched because we'd already made the playoffs. The game didn't matter. We're in Denver. He brings us back. We win. After the, after the, the game, I am in the locker room, and I, I, I interview like I always do, and I go up to him and I interview, and I hit my record button, and, and I go, and then I have a great 10-minute uh, r recording, and then as I'm walking off and I thank him, uh, I realized that I hadn't hit the, the button twice because it's a fail-safe safe thing, so I know exactly. Oh, it's yeah. right. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my goodness. And so I go back to him, and I just I tell him what happened, and I said, can we just get a couple questions in so... Um, I can at least get something to the station. And he goes, no. He goes, just, let's just do the whole thing over again. And literally, I asked very much the same questions. He, he responded the same way. And, and he, was, he couldn't have been a nicer person. And I have been on some private flights with this person, when, with, with him, when he's in the offseason raising funds for some boys' charities and whatever, and where he's been paid very handsomely. And it is not lost on him what he's doing, which is raising funds for other things. Yeah. And he's amazed that the ball that he's signing or the jersey is going for $10,000 and whatever. It's not lost on him, yeah. even though he's this, this star. And man, when you have that attitude and that type of leadership yeah. on a team, that's what allows you to get to six straight AFC championships and be playing in, in, in your fourth Super Bowl and have uh, two. I could gush about him the whole time. I know we don't yeah. have that time, but he's, he's, a special, he's a special player. Yeah, that's incredible. Well, tell us uh, about your journey. My dream. Your journey. Oh, my journey. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. 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 But it was a dream. Um, yeah. Uh, no, it, it was a, well, it was, it was a dream. I, you know, I, I was born outside of Wichita, Kansas, Rose Hill, small farming community. Um, very good athlete there. Went to Pittsburgh State University. Uh, to, yes, go Gorillas, absolutely. Um, uh, and and I'm, the, I'm the assistant to the president there also, so I'll be coming for you for money afterwards. Um, <laughs> I, I'm kidding also, obviously. But, um, you know, I went there to play football and get my degree. And quite honestly, in, in that fashion, my dream, my journey was to play in the NFL, and I, I, I did that. I was uh, drafted by the Pittsburgh Steelers 
uh, in the 11th round, 291st person taken, so right away feeling very good about myself. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, um, you know, to get to where I was and, and play for 15 years, um, it was a dream. It, it has been my journey. Um, uh, and, you know, we're going to dive into that a little bit more, but I, I think it's, it's interesting to, to note, um, of course, we all know who Mitch Holtis is, and I used to, to broadcast with him, uh, best in, in, in the NFL and what he does, uh, the radio broadcaster. Uh, for the Pittsburgh Steelers, there was a gentleman by the name of Myron Cope, uh, and he was this iconic uh, announcer there. And the Steelers, of course, back then, 11th and 12th rounds, not very many people make the team. Uh, and, and most people understand that. The Steelers understood that. They actually let Myron Cope, their radio announcer, their equivalent of Mitch Holtis, make uh, the draft pick. So I wasn't even picked by the Steelers. I was picked uh, by, exactly, I was picked by the radio announcer. So, and when I found out, really feeling good about myself. Um, uh, but that being said, um, you know what, my journey, which we're going to dissect here a little bit maybe, uh, going to the NFL and, and, and living my dream and having a chance to do so many different things has been phenomenal, um, both great and, and both lows also. Yeah. And um, I, I think that's, that's an important thing you have to learn in life is it, it's not all here all the time. It's, it's down here. And, and quite honestly... Um, I don't know if this makes sense, if I'm saying it the right way. When it's up here, sometimes you don't, you don't always need your faith mm. or you feel like you don't. Yeah. You always do, but you don't always feel it. But when you get down here, right. uh, then all of a sudden, yeah, it, it's a little bit different. And, you know, I just celebrated my, my first uh, wedding anniversary with my beautiful wife, Paige, and, and, you know, this was our second marriage, and that's never your plan. Um, so, uh, you know, been divorced six years and dealing with those things, um, it was then that that faith really came into play for me yeah. uh, in that instance, other places as well. Sure. But uh, again, I've been hitting the head too many times. I pontificate. I start <laughs> going on a tangent. So you may have to stop no, me at times, good. but you're that's good. that's some of my journey. You're good. You know, it was interesting. You and I sat down on Monday uh, and had a conversation about this and that kind of thing. And one of the things that stuck out to me immediately was, you know, you said one of the things you always say is that football is what you did. It wasn't mm -hmm. who you are. Right. Uh, and I think that's so powerful because I think from, you know, when, for, for those of us who appreciate football, who watch football, you know, we, we look at what these guys are doing today and we go, well, that's it. That's the pinnacle. That's right. the top of yeah. life. Life doesn't get any better than that. Right. And we think they must look, they, they play in the NFL, they're playing the Super Bowl. They must have no problems. Right. Not so much though. Right. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Right. No, it is. It, it is not. And, and, and you're right. And, and I always said, you know, football is what I do. It's not who I am. Yeah. What I found out was it was maybe a little bit more who I was than I, than I thought. Mm. And, and I think we all deal with that. I mean, what you all do, whatever profession would I do, uh, we deal with the same things. It's a different skill set. Okay. We all deal with the same things, which sometimes we're insecure. Sometimes we're a little full of ourselves. And, and um, you know, for me, uh, you know, when I changed professions and wasn't sure who I was and what was going on, I, I you know, later on had a marriage crumble, had, had issues like that. That's not the easiest stuff to deal with. And um, sometimes, not sometimes, all the time in life, quite honestly, you get humbled. Yeah. Um, but, but again, I think that's when it comes back to your faith and, 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 and the fact that the, the grace, mercy, and forgiveness that there is yeah. there. I mean, without grace, I mean, I don't know. I mean... I've done some great things in my life, and I've done some really terrible things in my sure. life. And thank yeah. goodness uh, that I do have that grace. Uh, and I try to learn from that also in terms of extending it to others. And quite honestly, maybe, maybe the hardest thing uh, it, that we have in, in life sometimes is extending that grace to ourselves and understanding yeah. that we're not perfect. Uh, right. A lot of high performers are very insecure. Yeah. I was the best in the world at one point in time as a long snapper, and one of the most insecure people you would ever find and mm -hmm. still battle with that insecurity, yeah. uh, which got me to that level. But we all have something we're battling. That's yeah. why I talk about so many different things uh, open, uh, openly and vulnerably. And I'm sure. a big Brene Brown fan. And if you haven't read her, I read her, her work you need to, but um, especially you gentlemen. Um, but uh, it's... It, it, it's it's phenomenal. I, again, I'm on that tangent again. I'm yeah. just I'm right off. No, of you're it. good. You got to get but me back I, on I the boat. I think that's what's so interesting. <clears throat> but what you're saying is so interesting because you know, like, 
to say I'm at the top. Like I, I, at one point in time, I was at the top. I, I reached it. Yeah. I couldn't be better. Right. Than I, than I was at that. And I think that for so for so many of us in our lives, right, this is the this is the thing that we do. We we put some sort of level of achievement on a pedestal, and we tell ourselves, if I can get to that place, if I can reach that mountaintop, if I can reach, and, and we're all striving for something, right? Whether it's in our field, if I could, if I could get to this level in business, we have successful business people in here. If I could get this level in my bank account, then then I'd be okay. And and I think what we find is it's not just in the sports arena, right? You can get into to the mountaintop, you can get to the pinnacle, you can have right. the greatest success. And yet, even though you get there, you find yourself in this place of like, but why do I still feel empty? Right. Why, why, do I, why, why did this thing that I thought that was going to save me, why does it not feel like it's saving me? And the, and the conclusion I think that, that people have to come to is that that's been, the whole, that's been the deal the whole time, right? You've been trying to save yourself. Exactly. I was trying to do it myself, and we, yeah. can, we have to understand that we can't do it ourselves. Right. Uh, and that is not an easy thing to learn. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 I think it is the antithesis of, uh, of kind of how we're hardwired at times. And yeah. when we have to, the, the, the quicker we understand it, the quicker we, the quicker time we'll have in, in doing things. And again, I think, um, was it Toby Mac, the song I loved, I don't want to gain the whole world and lose my soul. Yeah. I mean, there's so much in this world that buys for our attention mm -hmm. on a daily minute, minute by minute basis and understanding that none of the, uh, the material things go with us. That, that's not what life's about. And I was as guilty as anybody and can still be as guilty as anybody of, of getting my, my head turned or whatever, but understanding first things first yeah. and how important that is, uh, I, I think is so big. Um, you know, what comes to mind is I remember, you know, I was at Pittsburgh State University. I appreciate my gorillas over here. We won the national championship in 1991. And <laughs> you're absolutely right. Not why I was there. Not why I was there. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, but yes. Uh, but uh, I remember being on the sideline as the, 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 the seconds were ticking away and we were going to win the national championship. And I audibly said to somebody next to me, a coach, I was like, so this is it? Hmm. This is all there is? And I mean, because it was over. I mean, and you know what? In, in life, it's constant. We, physically, we're constantly chasing things. It's that A B paradigm where, where you're at A and you want to get to B. But the right. fact is, when you get to B and you think everything's going to be perfect, I'm right. an NFL player. I'm a Pro Bowl. I'm this. I played and that. On everything. All of a sudden, that becomes A, and there's another B, and you have to keep reaching. And, and it, it it can never be enough. Yeah. It, it never it never satiates you the way. Mm -hmm. uh, this does, right. this fellowship uh, with God and, and the belief and everything going on. And that doesn't mean that everything's going to be perfect. I think that's sure. the one thing we get, yeah. I get messed up sometimes is, is it's not going to be perfect. We, under, we understand we're still yeah. going to make, we're still going to make mistakes. We're still going to fall, but it's how you get up and, and more importantly, uh, who you look to, yeah. to get back up. I think, I think that's so powerful because, <clears throat> you know, I think the, the, the thing that creates this playing field that becomes so even is that what I, what I even discovered in my life is that the universal language is pain. Mm. Not everybody understands success. In fact, there's a lot of people that may not even understand joy. Everybody gets pain. Yep. And, and what I, what I think is so powerful about the way that, you know, we're talking about like, let's not dance around it. We say, Hey, look, what we've discovered is that we've been trying to save ourselves. We can't. We need a savior. Right. And so we know that Jesus is the savior. What's the way that Jesus saved us? Well, he comes to earth. Here's what he does. He lives the life that we cannot live. He, he lives in the way that we cannot live. And then he receives the punishment that we deserve. And when you look at the crucifixion, this is the height of pain. So Jesus takes, through his redemption for us, he speaks the universal language. In a way that he says, I know pain, and I can redeem you from it. I know pain, and I can save you from it. And I think that there is this striving that we find in our lives so often, is this idea of like, I understand now that I may need a savior. And so then what we do is we stop striving for stuff, and we start striving to get good enough so that God will accept us. Right. We start striving, like if I could just, like I'm not in a good enough place right now, but if I could be a better person, then maybe God will love me. And this is the beautiful nature of a relationship with Jesus is that where he meets us is in our brokenness. 
where he meets us is in that place uh, of pain. And he says, look, I, I recognize that you can't save yourself. And so here I am to be your savior. And, I, and I'm wondering we t- if there's a moment that you can look at in your life where you're in that place of brokenness where you felt like, you know what, God met me there. Uh, I, I think it was during my times during my divorce and, 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 and doing some therapy and, and some of the folks that I was talking with, because I, I was with both therapist and, and, and my church with, with therapy. And, and I remember it, it being described as, as God, you know, just think about him wrapping his arms around you and being there no matter what. Us, what. You talk about him meeting us in our, our, our place of pain and helping and, and understanding the fact that I, I think sometimes we eschew things, or I eschew things, because I think I don't deserve it. But that's what grace is: is is that forgiveness when we don't, for, then we don't deserve it. Right. And so, um, I, I think that was a very hard thing for me to deal with. It continues to be a very hard thing for me to deal with. Um, just because we we know things are true uh, and that we need to do it a certain way, it doesn't mean that it's easy to do sometimes. Yeah. Um, so I, I think getting past that and, and understanding that is is so very important. It's was it was it's been the most important thing in my life, certainly. Yeah, I think it, it's such a fascinating thing to look at the temporary things of life right. and to pin our hopes into things that are temporary. You know, I, I, one of the things I teach, and I'm I'll probably teach us again later in the years. Just bear with me, okay? So, but when you look at Genesis 1 and you look at the creation story, it says that man was like, here's how, here's how human beings were created. That God took the dust of the ground and he breathed his breath onto it. So humanity is this combination of two things. The breath of God and dirt. Okay? So, like, if we were going to rank those two things, what do you think the emphasis should be on, the breath of God or the dirt? Right, the breath of God is, our, this is what gives us a soul. Right? But we're obsessed with the dirt. We got to get more dirt. And so many of our achievements that we, we look to are really all about the dirt. And then it's no wonder, right, that we find ourselves in these places of unfulfillment because we're so dirt-focused. And I'm, I'm sure that you've seen this, right, that, that no. people will, will get to that stage, they'll get to the mountaintop you just talked about, winning a national championship, and then just, like, shrugging your shoulders and going, what is this? Is this it? Yeah. I mean, it, you understand that there's more to life than, than just tangible things. You know, one example I use a lot is deal or no deal, um, and, you know, it's, it's that allure of all that money, mm-hmm. even though there's quite a bit there as well, but the, you can't help yourself. And, and, and you, sh- you push the box, you shut the box, and, and now all of a sudden you can't hit the button um, yeah. uh, and, and take the deal because of your love for physical things in this life. Um, and uh, Is there a sense, too, that, like, in a moment it can be taken from you? Like, that, you know, if you're... Whether it's injury or oh, things absolutely. like that, you know, there's that sense that, that like, hey, I've, I've strived for all of this, and in a moment, like, you see this devastation in sometimes people with, where, where something takes that away. Right. Is that a sense that people have, like, they're, they're living in that, that place of this may go away so quickly? Uh, I don't think we do all the time, but I think we should. Yeah. I mean, I I'm, might have had a better example of it. Uh, through my 15 years in the NFL because I saw so many people who were at the top of their game, they have an injury, and then all of a sudden uh, they're done with that. So if this was the the pinnacle of their success and it's gone now, now what? Right. I mean, uh, and that's sad. I mean, yeah. and I was fortunate. I, I, I was only hurt one time uh, during my career, missed six games. Otherwise, played that. I played 243 uh, regular season games mm-hmm. uh, or, or and playoff, whatever. But I was fortunate, but I always knew. Yeah. Um, and, and this just came to mind. I can remember with the Steelers being on the field, warming up, and a few of the guys start singing it, and then we'd all uh, all be singing it uh, to, a, to a degree, which is we'd be like, this may be the last time. It may be the last time. I don't know. And it was, it was just like, yeah, you, you got more than you deserve here yeah. right now with that. I understand. <laughs> Bargain for. But, um, you know, just understanding that, you know, this is fleeting. Yeah. Um, now, 
it's just that physical thing of playing the game, but you can take that you could take that over to our life. You never know in the blink of an eye something happens. And yeah. when it happens, where are you at? Where, where are you at internally yeah. uh, with everything, with your relationship with God? Yeah. I mean, like I was telling them earlier, I hurt my foot on Monday. I don't know how I did it, but like, you know, you struggle through things. I'm, not, I'm just, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just playing around. Uh, <laughs> no, I think that that's so, that's so powerful and poignant that we, we so often pin our hopes to temporary things. Right. And, and to, to have this hope that we could have in Jesus that's eternal, you know, and, and even to say like that he meets you in your suffering, you know, scripture says that he binds our wounds, you know, and so there's this hope that we found in relationship with him that is not just temporary, but it's eternal. And what a thing to lean into, uh, you know, as opposed to the temporary. And don't, and don't get me wrong, like the dirt's fun. Right. Right. And, and there's joy that comes with, and there's things like, I'll tell you today, if the Chiefs win today, my neighbors will shoot off fireworks. They're going to have fun, right? And it will be, and this is the whole thing, and if your team wins today, it will be a fun day. It will be a great day, right? Right? And then you're going to get up tomorrow. And your life will not have changed. You're going to have to go to work. You're going to have to do the things that you've done. And so while, while today is fun, and I'm sure that everyone in this room is hoping for an outcome that you desire today, if you're pinning your hopes to it, it's just the dirt. And that's what's so powerful about our relationship with Jesus when he says, come to me, all ye who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So it's powerful about our relationship with Jesus where he says, I'll meet you where you are. It's what's powerful about our relationship with Jesus when he says, I'm the way. I'm the Savior, and the playing field is even for everyone. Well, and, and it, it just came to mind. I remember as the seconds were ticking off uh, in that, uh, that game when we played the Steelers, or, or played the, the Cowboys, and I was with the Steelers, the Super Bowl 30, and I don't remember the score, but uh, <laughs> still, it's still too soon. But um, <laughs> I remember the ticking off, and, and we're, not, we're not winning, and... I went up to this gentleman uh, that was a that was ball boy, and he was in his 50s or 60s, and I asked him, I said, can I get a ball? Because he's like, well, I'm not going to get a Super Bowl ring. Maybe I'll get, a super, you know, get the ball, and you'll remind me of something. And he goes, no, you, you, I, I'm not allowed to give you the ball. I said, okay, I, I understand that. And he goes, but I'm also not allowed to do anything if you take the ball from me. And uh, <laughs> so I said, I got you. I was born at night, but not last night. And uh I, I took that ball, and, and it was kind of a, a, a remembrance, a, a souvenir. But again, I was on the other end of it, and I lost. But as you said, the next day, it was still the same as if I had won. It was still yeah. the next day, and you know, I didn't have the Super Bowl parade or that stuff. But it, was, it wasn't noticeably different. Yeah. And, um, you know, that, that ball still I, – I still think of that story when I see that ball on my mantle, and I just smile, you know, at it. I don't, yeah. it's not, it's nothing I'll take with me uh, when I'm buried, just right. like, you know, the rings that I have, or that you can see when we're af afterwards, it, it's all material things. That, yeah. And it's, and it's fine. Like you said, it's the dirt. It can be fun at times Yeah. in the right context. Right. So what would you say? We'll finish with this. What would you say to somebody who's maybe here today? They've been pursuing success. They, that they found themselves in this place of, of emptiness. And what would you just say to that person in, in terms of giving their heart to the Lord? I think understanding that um, it's not it's it's not these tangible things that we can touch, but it's the intangible what's what's in your heart. And, and as I say, it's the easiest deal you can make that if you if you, if you believe in God, you, yeah. you have forgiveness. And and there's a lot that goes into it, no doubt about that. Yeah. But the fact that that grace uh, is extended to everyone, yeah. that 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 deal is extended to everyone. I think. Uh, that should make you feel good about things. I, I know it does for me. Yeah, 100%. Well, church, um, could, could we pray for Kendall today before we let him go? Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we've had to, to have this conversation, this wisdom and this insight that, that he's been able to bring to us through his experiences. And Lord, we just pray now that you would draw close to him and that you would bless him in the same way that he's blessed us today. Lord, would his presence be would your presence be near to him in a way that's tangible and real, Lord? And would this serve as an example for us today that we can know you and know your love? 
um, that we can uh, sense your heart for our lives, Lord, and that, um, God, that you would just bless him deeply and richly in his life, Lord. We thank you for, for moments where we can glean understanding in a way that we haven't before. So we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to let, you're going to go out to the lobby. He's yep. going to be right in the middle of the lobby today. Let people see the Super Bowl ring, yep. shake your hand, take a photo, that kind of thing. So thank you so much. Thank you for very being much. Here. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. That was fun, wasn't it? Enjoy that, man. I really did too. What a what a blessing to be able to talk in this way. So I was praying and preparing for this conversation this week. There's the scripture that came up in 1 John chapter 2. Would you put that up, guys? I want to look at it together. Here's what it says. It says, do not love this world nor the things that it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the Father's, the love of the Father in you. For the world only offers a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything that we see, and pride in our achievements and in our possessions. And these things are not from the Father, but from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. And this is really what we're talking about today. It's, it's this idea of that, like, look, will it be fun today if my neighbors shoot off fireworks for a minute until it gets too late? <laughs> will it be fun if the Chiefs win today? Yeah, for a minute. But I'm so grateful that my hopes are not pinned to a Super Bowl win. I'm grateful that my hopes are not pinned to how much success I find. I'm grateful that my hopes are not pinned to the things of this world because I have a relationship with Jesus and that means that my hope is eternal. And that the, there is hope for every person in this room that if you're in the high of the high or in the low of the lows, the playing field is even because of the love of Jesus. And so I'm grateful today because of his love for us that was extended for us, that he did come and lived the life that we could not live and died the death that we deserved. But yet because of his love for us, there is a grace that is extended that means that I don't have to live for the temporary, I can live for the eternal because his love lasts forever. So are you grateful for the love of Jesus today? There's nothing like it. Nothing like the love of Jesus. Thank you so much for being here today. We're grateful for you. Would you stand with me today as we dismiss this service? There's lots to do in the lobby. I know Kendall would love to meet you. Go out and uh, see him. He'll be right in the middle of the lobby. Casey Wolf is out in the lobby. We've got popcorn. We've got cookies and a lot to enjoy and celebrate today. Um, and we're grateful that you would take the time to come and hang out with us today. We'll put the ways that you can give up on the screens. There's kiosks in the back of the room, but I'll get you out of here today. If you would, posture yourself to receive the blessing today. So Father, would you bless them and keep them? Would you make your face shine down upon them? Would you be gracious to them? Turn your countenance their direction and give them peace. In the almighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen. We love you, we believe in you, and we'll fight for you. Have fun, everybody.